In this video, we will prove Cauchy's theorem in complex analysis, which is actually just a logical consequence of two other results, the Cauchy-Riemann equations and Green's theorem. Cauchy's theorem states the following. If a function f of z is holomorphic in a simply connected region d, inside of a closed curve gamma, then the line integral of this function over gamma is zero. After proving this, in another video, I want to show you how important this result is in applied mathematics and also in physics. And I'll do it by mentioning 10 applications of it. I think it's really interesting, but let me know in the comment section if you guys would like to see a video about it. Only the applications of this theorem to physics and applied math in general. So let's start with Cauchy-Riemann. Let z0, which is defined as x0 plus i y0, be a point in the complex plane, and let f be a function from a region d to the complex plane, such that it is differentiable for any z0 in the region d. We can write f in the following way, basically a sum of a real part u plus an imaginary part v, both depending on x and y, which are the real and imaginary parts of a point z on the complex plane. As I said, f is assumed to be differentiable at z0, which in our case is not very different from our definition in the real line of differentiability. In other words, all it is is the limit of this difference between f of z and f of z0 over z minus z0. As we can see from this definition of derivatives, there is no restriction on the direction from which z can approach z0 on this complex plane. Since we have this freedom here, let's firstly approximate z0 along the horizontal line y equals y0. So using the definition of the derivative, we get this limit for x that tends to x0, as we see in the graph. Notice that f can be written as u plus iv, a real and imaginary part. So we can use this to break the limit into two parts, a real part and an imaginary part. But this is just the same as writing the partial derivative of the real part plus the partial derivative of the imaginary part. And notice that I'm using this notation here just to make things more compact. So we found out that the derivative of f at point z0 is just a partial derivative with respect to x of f at point z0. Now we can do the same approximation, but along the y-axis, the vertical axis, with x equals to x0. So doing the same now vertically, so along the line x equals x0, as we see in the graph, we can calculate the derivative in a very similar way as we did before, using this limit. But this time, y tends to y0. Next step is to notice that f can be written as u plus iv. And then we break this limit into two parts, the real and imaginary one. Notice that the signs are different here in comparison to the previous one. But anyway, in the end, we get the partial derivatives of v and u for the real and imaginary parts. And we conclude that the derivative of f at point z0 is the same as minus i, the partial derivative of f with respect to y at the point z0. And therefore, the partial derivative of f with respect to x at point z0 is the same as minus the partial derivative of f with respect to y at the point z0. So combining these two results, we get this equality. And this implies the following. All I'm doing here is opening f into its components, u and v. Notice how we have the real and imaginary parts here. That's the correspondence between them, left and right hand side of the equation. And therefore, we found the system of equations, which are exactly what we call the Cauchy-Riemann equations, which relates the partial derivatives of the real and imaginary parts of a function f in different directions, so vertically or horizontally, with respect to x or with respect to y. And these are the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Next step is to prove Green's theorem. In order to simplify the explanation, I'll prove it only for the case in which we have a positive-oriented, piecewise smooth, closed curve gamma with winding number 1 that bounds a simply connected region D on the complex plane. Okay, let me clarify each one of these terms. Positive-oriented. It means that the curve is oriented in a counterclockwise direction. Piecewise smooth. It means that maybe the curve is not smooth and maybe not differentiable everywhere. Maybe it has some pointy corners like this one, but at least one thing we know, that we can decompose it into pieces such that each one of them 
is differentiable. Closed curve, well, it starts and ends at the same point. Winding number equals to 1. I suggest you watching my video about Liouville's theorem, where I explain it in details in the beginning of the video. You can see there the definition of winding number. But anyway, in our case here, we can consider it meaning that the curve goes around this point Z0 in the region D, just once. And finally, simply connected, which means that the region D has no holes on it. Now that we established all these conditions, let's see the equation we want to prove. So that's the equation we want to prove here. That's just Green's theorem. And this is true for any function P, depending on X and Y, and for any function Q, depending on X and Y, that are continuous, such that their partial derivatives with respect to X and y are continuous for points inside of the region D and on the curve gamma. Consider the x component of points on the curve gamma ranging from a to b and the y component of points on the curve gamma ranging from g1 of x to g2 of x, where g1 and g2 are lower and upper boundary functions of the closure of D respectively. And by the closure of D here, I mean the region D together with its boundary, with points on gamma. Now let's break gamma, which is a closed curve, into two open curves, gamma 1 and gamma 2. So first we break gamma into gamma 1, this curve here on top. And then we can break it also into gamma 2. So gamma is just the sum of them. The line segment that connects these two points, AG1A and BG1B, is the lower boundary for the closure of D. And the line segment that connects these two points, BG2B and AG2A, is the upper boundary for the closure of D. This way we can parametrize gamma in order to calculate the integrals that we are interested in. One of them is the integral from A to B of p of x g1 of x along gamma 2. And the other is the integral from a to b of p of x g2 x along gamma 1. Notice the negative sign here. This is because the direction of gamma 1 is reversed. So now we can write the following. That's the first equation we'll need here. Let's do something very similar now but breaking gamma in the y direction. Now we do something very similar as before. We break gamma into gamma 1 and gamma 2, but vertically this time. Now the line segment connecting the points AG1A and AG2A is the left boundary for the closure of D. And the line segment connecting the points BG2B and BG1B is the right boundary for the closure of D. This way we can parametrize gamma to calculate the integrals we're interested in. So the integral from G1A to G2A of QAY along gamma 2, and minus the integral from G2B to G1B of Q of BY along gamma 1. Again, notice the negative sign, which is a consequence of the reverse direction of gamma 1. So now we can write the following, and that's our second equation here. We'll use these two results, and then we'll show that their sum is equal to the integral of the difference of the partial derivatives of P and Q in their respective directions over the region D. Let's use the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the integral over this region D of the partial derivative of P with respect to Y is just the composition of these two integrals. Now we effectively use the fundamental theorem of calculus, and then we put the negative sign outside. And then we find out, using our equation 1 that we found before, that this is just minus the line integral over gamma of p dx. In conclusion, it's the same as minus the line integral of p. Now let's do the same for the term with q. We just do the same as before, but this time the range goes from g1b to g2b and from a to b. We use the fundamental theorem of calculus, and then we notice something. We notice that G1A is the same as G1B, and G2A is the same as G2B. This can be seen from the graph, just by the way we defined these functions, G1 and G2. And then we finally use our second equation that we found before, and we can conclude that this integral is actually the line integral over gamma of Q dy. And the conclusion is that this double integral over the region D, partial derivative of Q with respect to X, is the line integral over gamma of Q dy. Now we can put these two results together. We sum them. We just add these two equations. And then we get this equation right here, which is what we are trying to prove, also known as Green's theorem.
Now we can finally use Green's theorem and the Cauchy-Riemann equations to prove the Cauchy theorem. Just to remind you, we're trying to prove that for any holomorphic function f in the region d inside of gamma. Since f is a complex function, as we said before, we can split it into the real and imaginary parts, u plus iv. And then we can write this line integral over gamma of f of z this way. Working on the terms here, we can split the two integrals into a real and imaginary parts. And then we can use Green's theorem to rewrite this from a line integral to a double integral over the region D. And we see here that we have exactly Cauchy-Riemann equations inside of each one of these integrals, so they are just zero. And in conclusion, we found out that the line integral of f of z along gamma must be zero. And that's exactly what we wanted to prove. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. And let me know what kind of contents and proofs you would like to see in the channel. I'm always open for suggestions. Thank you and see you guys next time.